So for today's movie review, I'll be reviewing Ride Your Wave, and I'm not even going to pronounce this director's name, but it's the same guy that directed movies ranging from Mind Game, The Night is Short, Walk On Girl, to Lou Over the Wall. But anywho, enough about that. I actually have a particularly funny story in regards to me reviewing this particular movie, because ever since Disney lost the rights to release all the Studio Ghibli movies on home video, another American film distributor company called G Kids bought the rights to those Studio Ghibli movies and not only re-released the well-known classics such as Spirit Away and Princess Mononoke, okay, but also released a ton of other Studio Ghibli movies that had never been released here in the United States before. And of course, going to my welcome Walmart and seeing most of the G Kids releases of the Studio Ghibli movies, I remember seeing Ride Your Wave sitting next to all the other G Kids releases of the Studio Ghibli movies thinking it was another Studio Ghibli Ghibli movie called Ocean Waves because that's one of the few Studio Ghibli movies I have not seen yet and I decided to blind buy Ride Your Wave thinking it was Ocean Waves because I just remember there's a Studio Ghibli movie with waves in the title. It wasn't until I arrived home and started watching Ride Your Waves in which I realized oh this wasn't produced by Studio Ghibli because I also forgot G-Kids not only released movies from Studio Ghibli but they also did home video releases of other movies as as well. And I will admit this did put me in a sour mood upon first watching it. Since then some time has passed and I've been seeing a lot more reviews for Ride Your Wave in which I noticed a lot of people talking very high praise about it and this got me both curious and confused because I thought maybe they were talking about a different movie but no they were clearly talking about the same movie. Some time has passed since that initial first viewing, and I figured I need to take a break from working on various movie reviews based on either superhero or giant monster movies, so I figured maybe reviewing Ride Your Wave will be a nice change in pace on my behalf, which leads us into our question. Will I appreciate Ride Your Wave now, full knowing that it's not a movie produced by Studio Ghibli? As for the plot of the movie, a surfer, along with a firefighter soon fall in love sometime after a fire breaks out at the surfer's apartment building and just as the two become inseparable a tragedy occurs in which the firefighter loses his life in an accident at sea and some time has passed and one day the surfer discovers that when she sings a particular song the firefighter reappears in any body of water no matter if it's in a pool or a cup which rekindles their love for each other. However, can the two of them sustain their love for each other through this supernatural way, or has the rekindled romance been nothing more than a figment of the surfer's imagination? Now, in terms of what I liked about the movie, honestly, the first thing I liked about the movie isn't really that important, but it was just something that got a chuckle out of me the first time I saw the movie, that being a reference to the Super Sentai. And the reference in question, I don't know if this was based on a pre-existing incarnation of the Super Sentai or if the designs used in this movie were made just for the movie. Whatever the case, I thought it was just a really cute joke that did get a chuckle out of me the first time I saw the movie. Now on to the actual critiques of the movie. One of the strongest aspects of the movie so far is the pacing of it. For the simple reason that on pen and paper it should not have worked. In that sense where for a short run time of 95 minutes it manages to cram in a whole year's worth of time within that 90 minutes, which is something I didn't think was possible. Because when I think of a rom-com that tries to shove in a lot of time in a short time frame, I think of the 2012 romantic comedy, The Five Year Engagement, which is two hours. But the problem with that movie's pacing was it tries to cram in five years worth of material in a two hour time frame, which made the movie's pacing super slow to a point that the first time I ever saw that movie, in the first 20 minutes, I honestly thought three hours had gone by. And when I realized that we were only at the 20 minute mark and not the full two hours, it was going to be a bumpy ride, which it was. With this 
movie, on the other hand, yes, the entire story takes place over the course of one year, but the filmmakers manage to pace the movie out so well that it doesn't feel like a whole year had gone by from the time the movie started to its end point. And it's not that the movie was moving at a fast speed, neither. It was taking its time going from one plot point to another. Another aspect of the movie that I really liked is the way the production design plays with color in association with the water in this movie because on my Blu-ray DVD copy of the movie it came with a little pamphlet and on it there's a little statement that said that the director really liked the idea of playing with water within the realm of animation since water can take on any shape. And I just find it kind of interesting that nowhere within the context of that pamphlet talks about the way he used color in association with the water in the movie. Because anytime you see any body of water, there's always a different color to it, depending on the scene itself. And before I go any further, I should mention that colors here in America mean one thing, but colors in Japan mean something else. For example, here in America, the color red could either mean dangerous or sometimes love, but something generally evil, whereas blue is seen as being more relaxing or heroic, whereas in Japan, it's the other way around, where red is seen being more heroic while blue is more often associated with evil in some cases. And I'll come back to this comparison a little later, but anywho, the one thing I noticed about the color that the water takes on within this movie, it's either something that sets the tone or it's meant to represent a state of mind for our main character in some shape or form. Starting with the color yellow, because sometime within the first 20 minutes of the movie, before the boyfriend meets his demise, he goes surfing early in the morning as the sun is rising and the ocean water is yellow in color which is a very interesting visual choice that makes sense within the context of the scene given that the sun is rising so the water would be like this orangey yellow color but it's predominantly yellow but not only that the color association during that sequence it was basically a warning sign for the audience that something bad's about to happen it's very ominous in the way it was presented fast forward to some time later in the movie when we have a flashback to that scene when we actually eventually find out why the boyfriend went surfing early that morning yes we actually do see the boyfriend surfing on those yellow waves but the context is presented as being more hopeful as the boyfriend's given this sort of monologue that the main character should at some point ride her own waves, presenting the water in a more positive outlook for our main character. As for the next color being green, the context in which the water is green, our main character happens to be at a toilet, and the toilet bowl itself is green in color. So when we see the boyfriend within the context of the water of this green toilet bowl, it's meant to represent her state of mind at the moment, because green typically means nature, something natural, or in some cases it can mean supernatural, which would also make sense given that the boyfriend only appearing in a body of water has a sort of supernatural quality to it, something I will be discussing later in this video. But I think within the context of this scene, the water within the green toilet bowl is meant to represent the character's state of mind, because green can also mean sickness, in that sense where she's the only one able to see him in any body of water, whereas everyone else doesn't. And when you have certain characters seeing her talking to a body of water, they all think that her mental state state has deteriorated to a point where maybe she's gone crazy in that she is very sick psychologically speaking then of course there are points in time where the water no matter if it's the ocean or a simple brook in which the water takes on the color black to represent the character's depressive state of mind given that she is grieving over the death of her boyfriend. Then of course you have blue, which is what water is typically depicted as in most mediums. And blue is often, as I mentioned before, seen as a very calming color. But also, like I said before, within the Japanese context, it could also be seen as being evil. And I think that perfectly aligns with the way the boyfriend is seen in any body of water for the remainder of the movie, because he does take on this ghostly appearance, showcasing many different shades of blue. Because on the one hand, anytime she's seen with him, she's very calm and happy to be with him again in some shape or form. But I also think this works against her because... 
The Dead Boyfriend can also be seen as the movie's major antagonist in a psychological way, since the movie is about grief and moving on from it, which I'll discuss in a little bit, and she basically refuses to move on from his death, which is why I think him being blue works the way it does for this movie. And another aspect of the movie, or not even aspect, one of my favorite scenes in the entire movie occurs sometime midway through the movie when you have our main character taking this thinless porpoise blow up floaty she receives as a gift from her dead boyfriend and fills it up with water, sings the song, and they both dance together. I like this particular sequence because I find the scene to be both very wholesome but also very funny at the same time. Given that, we see her dancing with this thinless porpoise filled with water that contains the ghost of her dead boyfriend. Just something about that whole idea and pen and paper just sounds super funny. And has a sort of surreal quality to it because it is just a regular person interacting and dancing with this inanimate object that contains the soul of her boyfriend. I don't know what it is, but that whole scene just came off as funny to me. Another aspect of the movie I liked is the thematic that this movie has in association with it because most romantic comedies or even movies that revolve around romance usually have the theme that love is something to strive for, love is healthy, something you see in a lot of love stories, at least from my experience. Yet this movie handles it differently because the th main theme of the movie isn't about love, but grief and moving on from it. Which, for a movie that's essentially a romantic comedy, but yet its theme isn't about love, but grief, is a very bold direction to go in. And this is something that's really never been done before within a romantic movie. The only other movie I could think of that has love and grief in it would be the 1990 movie Ghost with Patrick Swayze and Demi Moore, but that movie was more serious with its handling of grief. Yet here's a romantic comedy that also tackles the themes of grief, which is something I've never seen done before. Sure, I will admit, romantic comedies or even romantic movies in general aren't really my bread and butter, and I haven't really seen too many of them, so maybe there is another example out there of a movie doing this, I just haven't seen it yet. And not only that, but the movie also showcases how people go through grief differently from person to person. And not only do I think it's impressive that a romantic comedy like this has a really serious theme, such as grief and moving on from it, but it also showcases how people handle grief differently as seen with our main character and her dead boyfriend's sister. Because our main character can't get over the fact that her boyfriend is dead, while the boyfriend's sister, on the other hand, is said that, yes, he's dead, but has come to terms with the fact that he's dead and has moved on. Which leads into another thing I like about the movie, in connection with its theme of grief. Because it also showcases how harsh life can be sometimes. Because, let's be honest, most people take life for granted. Since most people just presume that nothing dramatic will happen, everything will stay the same, in some cases. But then something dramatic happens and there's a change in the status quo. That can be for better or for worse, depending on the situation. As seen with our main character discovering that her boyfriend died within the first 20 minutes of the movie. Although I will admit, I do think the movie's tone does undermine the theme of the movie, which I'll explain later, but I think having a romantic movie tackling the theme of grief is both really good and important for people to experience. Now in terms of aspects of the movie that I have mixed feelings on, let's start with the big one, that being the animation itself. Because when you're looking at the landscape, regardless if it's the cafe or the beach, or even the ocean itself, they look amazing. And in some cases, almost reminded me of the type of scenery you would see in a Studio Ghibli movie. Granted, not quite as polished as a Studio Ghibli movie, but if you were to take a still image of some of the landscapes in this movie, they would make a great work of art. As for the animation on the human cast of characters, man, I don't know what happened here, but it looks subpar at best. Because like I said earlier, the landscapes in this movie look as if they were pulled from a Studio Ghibli movie. They look photorealistic 
realistic. Whereas the human cast of characters, on the other hand, look out of place. Like, to get an idea of what I'm talking about, if you see the 2015 Pixar movie, The Good Dinosaur, that's what I'm talking about, where you have this beautiful looking landscape with this, like, really cartoony looking thing. That's what I'm talking about. That's what most of the human characters look like in this movie. They just look really exaggerated and not in a good way. Everything from the way they move, their design, just looks off to me. Because proportionally, all the characters in this movie are very lanky in a sense where they reminded me of how most people stereotype what the Roswell aliens look like in most UFO conspiracy documentaries. They almost reminded me of that, especially our two main leads. And the shading for each of them does not look complete. Again, when you're looking at the lighting for landscapes, there's a lot of shading and it adds dimension. With the human cast of the characters, on the other hand, they look incredibly flat and they don't match the background whatsoever and i don't know if it's me but i swear to god all of the human characters in this movie had necks that were longer than normal because every time i looked at their necks i kept thinking did the guy who designed the characters for persona 3 do character designs for this because i swear to god all the characters had necks that are longer than they should have been and another problem i had with the animation for some of the human characters is that whoever did the animation for their hair or textures they used gradients which is a really big no-no in the world of not just animation but graphic design in general great you don't see it often but when you do it sticks out like a really bad sore thumb so in conclusion beautiful looking landscapes poorly handled animation for the human characters that being said for all i know this could just be an animation style done by the movie director himself because this is the only movie i've seen by this particular director so I don't know if this is his art style or maybe he just wasn't given enough budget to properly have the animators animate the human characters correctly but whatever the case animation for the human characters is definitely a very weak part of the movie for me. To get an idea of how different the animation is between landscapes and the human characters as mentioned before the landscapes look as if they were pulled from a Studio Ghibli movie. Sure it might not be as polished but looks Studio Ghibli Esque, whereas the human characters, on the other hand, look as if they came from Devilman Crybaby. And you get a general gist of the animation style for this movie. Another aspect of the movie I have mixed feelings on is the cinematography. Because for, honestly, 90% of the movie, the cinematography, in terms of the way the camera pans in certain scenes, shot composition, looks fantastic. No matter if it's our two main characters sitting on a dock, looking at the sunset, or simply having a character serving through a way and you see the character in the actual wave itself. But then there are some points in time where the cinematography goes in some really weird directions. It doesn't happen too often, but when that does happen, the shots stick out like a sore thumb, and I really don't understand the decision making behind some of these shots. The big one that stood out to me the most occurs during the climax of the movie when we see our main character and one of the support characters surfing down this wave of sorts. And the way the shot is set up. You have the support character on the board just lying down in the bottom of the screen, but then as the shot progressively moves towards towards like the downward slope of the wave, you see the main character's boobs flying overhead, creating this really weird shot that honestly did not need to happen. But as I mentioned before, the cinematography for 90% of the time is really solid. And while the movie does have its occasional weird shot, they don't happen too often. Now, in terms of what I disliked about the movie, actually, before we even get into the major problems I have with the movie, I have a nitpick to address first, that being, Anytime you see the characters getting soaking wet when they're not swimming throughout the movie, I don't know what it is, but the combination of the texture and the lighting and the animation does not make the characters look as if they are soaking wet by water, but it just looks as if they're covered in baking grease. Again, I'm not sure if this is a stylistic choice or if the animators didn't have a big enough budget to make it look like water, but as it is, the characters that are soaking wet look like they're soaked in baking grease as opposed to 
water, which honestly got a chuckle out of me because I don't think it was intentional whatsoever. I don't really have that many problems with the movie, but the few problems I do have with them, in my opinion, are really big problems that bring the movie down for me quite a bit. One of them being the movie's theme song, brand new story, that some of our characters sing throughout the movie, which apparently is an actual song that was made for the movie by a band called Generations from Exile Tribe, which is a Japanese vocal dance group of sorts. And the song itself I didn't think was all that good to begin with when you first heard it, but as the movie progresses, this song gets repeated over and over and over again. And it does not matter if you're watching the English dub or the original Japanese version of the movie, this song gets so annoying so quickly. And keep in mind, I was already fed up with this stupid song within the first 15 to 20 minutes of the movie before the boyfriend meets his end, and when our main character sings the song for him to appear in the water, she sings it constantly for the remainder of the movie and I just wanted to smash my head in. Like you have no idea how fed up I was with this song in terms of both hearing it and seeing how it was used within the movie, narratively speaking. Because I really don't understand why or how this song makes the main character see the dead boyfriend in a body of water. Because when you look at the lyrics of the song, the song itself ties in more with the theme of the movie, which to some extent made sense when you actually look at the lyrics, but why this particular song was able to make our main character see the dead boyfriend in a body of water, not so much. I was expecting some kind of explanation that somehow, one way or another, the song was inspired by Susano for some stupid reason, who's the Japanese sea god, and somehow that would tie in with the fantastical element, which I will discuss in a little bit, which results in our main character seeing the dead boyfriend in the body of water. But no, there is just no reason behind why this song makes our main character see her dead boyfriend. And speaking of fantastical elements, my next major problem with the movie is the fantastical element within the story. Which, if you're someone who's paid attention to my channel long enough, normally I love movies that have a fantastical element to them. But for this movie, the fantastical element did not work for me. Because sometime after the first act of the movie, when the boyfriend dies, and our main character starts singing that song, which allows her to to see him in any body of water, you, along with the main cast of characters within the context of the movie, are under the assumption that she's hallucinating the entire thing. Even when our main character is under the assumption that, yes, I can really see you, you're still under the impression that, oh, it's just in her head, and she's content with that. But as the movie progresses, there are two points in time where she sings a song, and suddenly you see the water do some really fantastic fantastical things, and when those two moments happen, it broke my suspension of disbelief. Because here's a movie in which I didn't think needed to have a fantastical element. It would have been better off if the whole thing was just an hallucination seen by our main character, but no. By adding the fantastical element in this movie, it just felt like a massive cop-out. And of course, the movie went in that direction of having some of the cast of characters who couldn't see the dead boyfriend before suddenly being able to see him, mainly during the climax, and go, wait, I can see him now? And speaking of the climax in connection to the fantastical element, the climax takes place in this abandoned hospital that's like a skyscraper or something, and it gets caught on fire. And our main character sings that stupid song one last time, and suddenly this gigantic column of water slowly goes up the tower, putting out the fire. And there's a bunch of firefighters that are like, uh, yeah, uh, update on the situation. There's a giant column of water putting out the fire now. We don't know why or how it's happening, but it's happening. And I just sat there thinking, why is this happening? It just didn't make any sense to me whatsoever. And there's no explanation as to why it's happening. By the time the movie was over, I was left with more questions than answers about the world building aspect of the movie than I was about the actual conclusion of both the story and the character arcs. And for the final problem I have with the movie has to do with tone. Because the movie, tonally speaking, because it's a romantic comedy, I found the tone of the movie to be incredibly cool 
horny from start to finish. Since you have all these characters say these lines of dialogue that you've heard in many other romantic comedies about how I'm going to love you forever and ever and blah blah blah. And I feel that the corny tone of this movie really did me in. Because the movie, as I mentioned earlier, has a really good message about grief and how to move on from it. Yeah, I feel the corny tone of this movie really ruins that message to a point that I couldn't take the movie seriously anymore. Which to me, I think is perhaps the biggest problem of the movie. Because I feel like the movie should have had a more serious tone to support the message, as opposed to having the movie be super corny. And I feel that because of a combination of the corny tone of the movie, the lack of an explanation behind the fantastical elements, along with that repeated usage of the song, is what really brought the movie down for me as a whole. So for my final verdict of Rider Wave, the movie is a romantic comedy that honestly has a really good message about grief that can be applied to anybody who's in or out of a relationship. That being said, I think other aspects of the movie don't do the message justice, from having inconsistent animation, fantastical elements that aren't properly explained, to the actual plot of the movie in regards to its story I found to be rather corny, which is saying a lot given that I'm the kind of person that loves movies that are either cheesy, campy, or corny. And for me to say this movie was too corny for me is saying something. However, that being said, do I think the movie's bad? No, absolutely not. I think the movie is passable enough to warrant at least one watch. So overall, Ride Your Wave, I personally think, is okay at best. And before I give my final rating, what did everyone else have to say about Ride Your Wave? So, the movie's got really good reception. I mean, I think the message behind the movie's good, I just didn't think the movie itself was that good. And so, for my overall rating of Ride Your Wave, I give it a 3 out of 5. So, what is your favorite movie and or anime TV show that falls within the romantic category? And see you later.